The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Inflation pressures, a lingering pandemic, and a government at Queen's Park freshly re-elected to handle it. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, as part of our partnership with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario from their annual conference last week, Steve Pakin's conversation about getting Ontario's economy back to full steam. That's next. We have uh, three superstars who are going to talk to us uh, this morning for the next little while about some of the hugest challenges that you all know all too well and that they are dealing with in their lives as well. So can I welcome out, first of all, the Senior Director of Policy and Innovation at the Smart Prosperity Institute. Here's Mike Moffat. <laughs> Hello, Mike. There you go. Far chair for Mike. Can we welcome the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers? Here's our Yalnesian. Armin, good, good morning. Here. Right here. And I think all of you will know who the Minister of Finance is for the province of Ontario from the capital city, Peter Bethlen Falvey. Now that's interesting. Armin applauded louder than all of you did for the Minister of Finance. I don't know what that means, Minister, but guy. we'll find out. We'll find out. I want to start by asking each of you uh, a pretty basic question. There are huge challenges going on right now in this province and country, and I want to know what keeps you up at night. Treasurer, why don't you start out? What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? I want to tell you up front that uh, you know, I sleep uh, like a baby, which is the good news. The bad news is I, I wake up every two hours and I cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they, but seriously, there there are some things uh, that, that are on our radar. First and foremost, uh, without question, is the economic uncertainty that we're, that we're uh, witnessing now, whether it's geopolitical. I mean, when we did our budget uh, last, uh, and, and when we first uh, tabled it to April 28th, we locked the numbers before the Russia invasion of the Ukraine. You don't know what's uh, around the corner. So so that's something we have to watch. And and we have a plan in place to, to mitigate whatever's around the corner. And, and we obviously ran on that plan in the budget. Uh, and I have confidence not only in the people of Ontario, but the businesses of Ontario. And we're going to weather whatever lies ahead um, and and we've got the uh, tools and resources to do that the second area that uh, i think about and i, I do want to also applaud armin uh, because she's a very thoughtful person thinks about things not just in the short run but the long run and our aging population is uh, is absolutely something that uh, i've been concerned about for some time i gave a remarks at the cd howe institute in 2010 on just this topic the aging population and for uh, our healthcare system, what that meant for labor shortages, what that meant for economic growth, what that meant for healthcare. Um, these, these issues, it's just math, it's not really ideology, but we need to have solutions uh, in place. And that's why I'm looking forward to this discussion today to, to talk about that. And of course, I I can't go without saying the, the fiscal situation, you know, we've, uh, uh, another reason I got into politics wasn't just the aging population and the economy. It was to to be able to balance the needs of investing for the future while, while at the same time being prudent and responsible. Um, you know, the debt that we put on now is going to be paid by future generations. So we have to think very carefully about the type of spending, the types of investments that we make. We're, we're putting a record amount in infrastructure, almost $160 billion. Our program uh, expenditures to invest uh, in our healthcare and education are historic and unprecedented. But I have to balance that as well with uh, being financially responsible so that we can weather future storms, be they an economic uh, uh, storm, a financial storm like 2009, 2008-2009, uh, or, or like a pandemic, or whatever else might be around the corner. So those are the types of things I think a lot about. Okay, Finance Minister, thank you. Irving, why don't you pick up on that? What keeps you up at night? I wonder if the Finance Minister is going to call me when he wakes up every two hours. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm waiting for that call, uh, uh, Minister, because I actually really admire what you are doing, and I just want to extend your point uh, to everybody that is here. People that run for political office to serve our population in any way deserve to be saluted. It is a thankless job. It is a very difficult job, and we need you more than ever. So thank you very much for what you are doing, Minister, but also thank you, all of you in this room, that have got your um, bulletproof vests mm -hmm. on and trying to deal with the challenges that are coming at you fast and furious. You know, population aging is the slowest moving train on the planet. I've been talking about it since I learned about it as a graduate student from the master of demographics, David Foote, the author of Boom, Bust, and Echo. And it has just been in imponderable to me that we haven't done more forward thinking. What keeps me up at night right now is this extremely difficult challenge between rising costs because of what's happening to inflation and the fact that our healthcare systems are in collapse right now as we're speaking. This isn't about forward planning. We are in a perma crisis, and it means not only the quality of our life, but life and death is on the line. There are lots of things we can talk about, but right now I'm worried that the fall is going to mean more people are going to be hungry, more people are going to be worried about having to leave their homes that are not, there's nothing more affordable out there right now, and that more people are going to get sicker quicker at a time when the system cannot support more illness, and we don't have a plan. I don't want to talk about money until we talk about what our plan is to get out of this situation. Mike Moffat. Well, again, I would uh, echo Armin's comments about, you know, uh, just thank you, those who, you know, put their name on the ballots and for a thankless job where you have to listen to loudmouths telling you what to do. So let me tell you what to do. Uh, <laughs> so. There's a couple things that we think of. So I'm the senior director of the Smart Prosperity uh, Institute, and a, a lot of our work at SPI is around the climate crisis. A lot of my personal work is around the housing crisis. So these are, are the two things that kind of keep me up at night. And I think we're obviously aware of both, but they also intersect with each other in some important ways. So I worry about flood risk. You know, the, uh, the, the climate change uh, issue, you know, we're going to see increased rainfalls in part of Ontario. We're losing some of the land right now, the, the wetlands that uh, soak up some of that water. So there's a real risk of increased uh, flooding. You know, Essex uh, County is, is one big area. Second one is loss of farmland. We're going to need to feed a hungry planet, and yet, obviously, we're losing 300 uh, acres of farmland a day to housing development. And the third one is climate refugees. And I don't see this as being, I think it's a really important topic, but one I don't see discussed a lot uh, by any levels of government. We know that larger parts of the planet are becoming uninhabitable, and people are looking for areas to live that have decent climate and a lot of fresh water, the Great Lakes may be the most attractive place on the planet to be in the next 30 years. So, you know, we need to be prepared for that. And that's both a threat and an opportunity. I think if we play this right, that gives us um, an opportunity to be, you know, one of the, the fastest, most productive growing places on the planet. But we need to be prepared for those, those long-term sort of glacial challenges. Okay, thank you three for sort of setting the table for the discussion to come. And let's dive a little deeper now. And Armin, I'll start with you on this. I suspect everybody in this room at some point has said to themselves, the demand for local services has never been more intense, and my access to revenue streams to pay for all of these things has never been more difficult. Give us some ideas. How do we make those two lines even out more? One of the phrases that we've heard over and over again during the COVID pandemic is government saying we've got your back. This is not a local problem. This is a global problem and we need the provincial government to have our municipalities back. I fully respect the challenging job the finance minister has to balance future investments with current needs and also keep life manageable for people paying taxes. But I don't think the province is doing enough of a job to make sure the basics are there, and it isn't up to municipalities to make sure the basics are there. So what does that involve? If he's not, it fell on that screen. If he's not doing enough, give him some advice about what he should be doing. 
I, I believe that you should be doubling down. First of all, this isn't just about expenditures, finance minister. It is about having a very clear plan about how you are going to fix the problems that we are facing, whether it is housing and climate change, whether it is health care, whether it is transportation. All of these things are nested. And people don't live in boxes that are defined by your municipal uh, you know, at the edges of your boundaries. People move around, and we want people to move around to take advantage of the enormous opportunity that exists in Ontario. You know, I don't know if you know this, but Canada is the ninth largest economy on the surface of the planet, and Ontario is the biggest economic engine of Canada. We can be and do anything we want, but we have to be and want to do more than we're doing. Mike, what would your advice be on that regard? We need to fix a, this housing crisis, and that's an economic uh, issue. Uh, you know, the, what, there are a couple ways you can raise revenue. Obviously, you can raise taxes, but you can also grow the size of the economy. And we are losing a lot of talent to other parts of, of Canada and, uh, and other where because families can't afford to live here. For the first time in my lifetime, we've had more Ontarians move to Quebec than we have Quebecers moving to Ontario. And I've got a, I've got a lot of gray hair, you know, so, you know, we haven't seen that since the mid-1970s. So this is a, a, a big, big issue. I am very concerned about our ability to attract and retain talent in this province if we don't deal with this housing crisis. Prices. We've got a lot of great investments. Again, I keep mentioning Windsor, but in the Windsor area, the new Solantis plant, you know, we have a big plan to uh, build uh, EV batteries, assemble cars. I'm not sure who's going to work at those factories. Who can live in these areas on those, those types of wages when you can, go, you, you can go south, you can go east, and you can go west and buy a house for half what it costs here? Okay, Minister of Finance, you've heard some wisdom from up here. How do you react to what you've heard? Well, first off, uh, Mike, I, I do have a lot of gray hair. You just can't see it because it's all in the back. <laughs> uh, so, so I think some really good points have been made there. I, I would say two things. First off, uh, you know, the budget that I tabled really is our plan to build Ontario and very clearly uh, to rebuild this economy. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about is the growth of the economy. I agree with Armin, but, you know, out of 38 OECD countries, the OEC economists put Canada in terms of growth potential over the next 30 years, number 38 out of number th out of 38, we're dead last. So we do have an economic challenge. I agree with Armin that we have all the resources necessary. We just have to you know, work together to get that done. And that leads me to my uh, second point is that uh, through the pandemic, it's multiple levels of government. It's not just the municipal. You asked about tools for the municipalities. We've given them funding through the Municipal Partnership Fund, which I announced uh, on Friday, stability on that, the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, which will help, to Mike's point, uh, really do the things for flood mitigation, for repair of infrastructure for 389 million, uh, 389 municipalities, a billion dollars. We doubled it from a billion, so now two billion, to help with uh, uh, infrastructure to mitigate some of the climate issues. Uh, the repair that we need to do, but but also uh, COVID supports through the pandemic. We worked with the federal government and the municipal government to kind of deliver those uh, those uh, services that they needed uh, in the time of need. So it's on multiple levels that I think uh, working with municipalities, giving them more powers like the strong mayors, so we can build the houses. That's an emer emerging uh, and, and critical need that we need to get done, not just talk about it, we need to get it done. So. I think it's not just about what tools can we give municipalities, how can we work together uh, to address these complex challenges that we have in front of us. Okay, I hear you, but humor me for a second, Minister, and that is for the 442 other municipalities that aren't getting strong mayor systems in place whenever this bill uh, becomes law, are you open to the notion of giving those that want it additional revenue streams to pay for the services that their constituents, many of them, want? Well, it, I, uh, I spent a lot of time listening to, to municipalities over the last uh, couple of days, and uh, you know we had a, a range of discussions, and we're, we're always talking about ways to 
to work together, uh, not least of which is, is through the municipal fund that we've given them revenue for operating uh, expenses and, and for infrastructure for capital. Uh, I, I've uh, got the vacancy tax, uh, which is uh, a number of municipalities have reached out to to go forward with uh, as another tool. So we're uh, we're working together to make sure that we can deliver the types of programs and services, which includes housing, that we need to get done in this province. Uh, I'm not trying to start a fight here between the minister and our friends here on. Well, maybe I am a little bit here. I don't know. Let's uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Mike, is that a satisfactory answer to the need? Well, I, I think there's a lot more to be done uh, now. I, I think the, the province does have a roadmap on housing. I think that the housing task force and their, their 55 recommendations would be a, a fantastic start. Uh, some of those have been implemented, but there's, uh, there's a long way to go. Um, but I think it is going to take provincial leadership. The, the issue, as you mentioned, we have 444 municipalities, and no one single of them can address a housing crisis. And, and we see this across you know, the, the 905, southwestern Ontario, where I'm from, is no municipality can create sort of enough housing to make it affordable because basically what happens is you just get more families moving in from other parts of the GTA. So it requires provincial leadership to have, you know, sort of across the board minimum standards. Again, the task force said things like duplexes and triplexes as of right. But that's where it has to come from because there's just, you know, families are mobile, uh, you know, people can move around. So one individual municipality, you know, no matter how well intentioned, is never going to be able to, to solve the housing crisis. Armin, can we talk inflation for a second here? No, can I, can I raise another <laughs> issue? <laughs> right on, okay. <laughs> I just want to point out another absolutely doable thing, which is incomprehensible how the province has decided to handle it. It got $13 billion to provide childcare to Ontario residents. There's money in the bank. We have been talking about how we're going to get more people working in an era of labor shortage. We have been talking about how we support young families. This isn't even provincial taxpayers' money. This is Canadian taxpayers' money that is sitting in the bank and waiting for you folks at the municipalities to come up individually with a way of uh, creating a portal for licensed care providers in your community to put their name forward, to be able to apply for the operating funding so that they can reduce parent fees. This is mind boggling. Everybody is doing it differently. There is absolutely no provincial guidance as to how to streamline this process. An organization, a nonprofit organization like the YWCA, which operates in almost all of your municipalities, has to do over 400 different applications in, as of September. This is mind boggling red tape. I thought this was the government that hated red tape. Where's the streamlining? Where's the ability to access money now when parents need it because of inflation? <laughs> I am now done. That, that, was my, that was my thing on inflation, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Can I get an amen for her, please? Right here. <laughs> uh, Minister Bethlehem Falvey, I know you're not directly responsible for child care, but... Uh, do you want to comment on some of the observations just made by Armin? Well, I, I love Armin's uh, passion on this, and I know she's been passionate about this. And uh, listen, there's no no daylight between Armin and I on this. I mean, we we, uh, in fact, on this panel, I think a year ago, we you know she she was saying let's get this child care agreement done, and I was saying we're getting it, going to get it done, and we did get it done—a a, longer-term deal with certainty of funding, uh, incorporating Ontario's unique footprint, but uh, there's no question that uh, this, this government is, is very focused on getting it done, working with the municipalities, working with uh, the many child care providers, and, and, it's, it, and frankly, it's, it started already and it's happening. Uh, we'll have more announcements to make on that, but they're directionally very positive. And, but listen, you asked about, uh, you know, inflation and things like this. this is one component. We also have the child care tax credit, which is helping low-income families on top of the $10 a day. Uh, we're, we also are increasing the minimum wage in, in just a, a couple of, about 60 days, again, to $15.50, which is amongst the highest in the country. We've got the low-income family uh, tax credit rebate, which is providing 
income re tax relief to uh, people making up to 50,000 is going to help 1.1 million people. That's the lowest personal income tax rate for low income workers in Canada. We reduced the gas tax uh, uh, on July 1st to, to provide some relief. And we saw the inflation numbers yesterday. They came down and Ontario led the way in terms of gas price uh, reductions to provide more relief uh, from the costs for families. We have a host of of tax credits, some, as I just mentioned, that have been in place. We doubled it to child care tax credit, but we're helping seniors age at home with tax credits to give them relief so that they can put the infrastructure in place so they can age at home. That uh, as a seniors tax credit to allow uh, help with funding home care at home. I've put in over a billion dollars in the last budget uh, for home and community care because that's the future. That, to allow people to age at home longer where they can be with their loved ones in an environment that they like. We've put money into a jobs training tax credit to help people bridge from the skills of yesterday to the skills of tomorrow that we need. So we're providing relief right across the spectrum. Uh, is there more to do? Always. I mean, we're, we're uh, very humbled by the majority that we've received. Uh, we ran on a plan to build Ontario. And uh, we're very focused on getting these things done, of which childcare is an absolutely important point, uh, part of it. Okay, Armin, can I ask you about inflation now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the people, again, in this room, they don't control the money supply. They don't set interest rates. They don't control the price of gas. Is there anything they can or ought to be doing as it relates to making the ravages of inflation less onerous on their constituents. What a great question. You know, it's true that you have very few levers available to you right now. And though this finance minister is one of my favorite conservatives, <laughs> he's either a shapeshifter or he's on the wrong team. I'm not sure which. Uh, but whatever it is that's going on, you're not going to get more money from him. Uh, so, uh, so what can you do? I think we have two COVID lessons. The first lesson is that during a period of extreme stress, which we had during the pandemic, municipalities prevented evictions, which in the fall we are going to need because these, the rental costs are actually accelerating faster than um, the only people that are being hurt by the Bank of Canada rising right now are people that have mortgages that are coming up due for renewal. That's a, a, a small fraction. Thanks for reminding me. 37% 37 of Canadians rent their homes. 35% of Canadians don't have a mortgage but own their home. So it's a subset of the rest of the people that are dealing with what's going on, but every renter is looking over its shoulder, his or her shoulder, and wondering, can I afford to live in my home as my food prices continue to, stock, uh, to rack up? So preventing evictions for a period of time. This is not a new normal. This is just what are we doing while inflation rates are escalating and we don't have a solution to the affordable housing problem. Because if people can't eat enough and they lose their shelter, there's no place cheaper for them to go to. We have run out of affordable housing. So that's job one is prevent evictions this fall. You might be able to do something other than what's going to come from the feds, which is a $500 housing benefit, which to my mind initially when they first came up with it was not a bad idea at the beginning of the inflation thing. Now it's like an apology for what's happened. It's no solution at all. Um, and if there's anything you can do to help with rent banks or bring your community together to help people that need to be able to stay in their housing. And the last thing I'll mention is transit. Now people are going to say to, to me, oh, there's a lot of rural um, municipalities here. But did you know almost three quarters of Ontarians live in eight cities alone? in Ontario. And I was really shocked when I saw Germany come up this summer as a post-COVID measure, offering a nine euro a month package all summer, June, July, August, to travel anywhere you wanted in Germany. Within a city, between cities, just we're going to make transit cheap. We should be doing that. We should be making free transit. I know we're having a fight in, on, in Ottawa where we are right now and where I now live. We're having a fight as to whether that is a crazy idea or a good idea. Can I just say it's an enormously good idea. Can we just get the buses running on time again, though? <laughs> and then make them free. Mike, inflation, advice. 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's not much you can do directly about prices other than, you know, if you're municipality, lower parking and things like that. But I think the focus could be on having people have to buy fewer things. I live in a walkable neighborhood, so I don't have to drive that much. I don't spend that much on gasoline, so I don't notice as much when it goes up. So are there things that we can do uh, on transit? Looking at areas, uh, you know, food deserts, so, you know, people can you know, buy, buy groceries at a much lower price than than having to go to convenience stores and that kind of thing. So I think what we need to look at is is, is those issues of how can we get people uh, to be able to buy fewer things. And and absolutely that you know and that plays on both the, the rural um, and urban side. A lot of those food deserts, somewhat ironically, are in rural areas. And as well, you know, having uh, better inner city transit, so you know somebody could drive a little bit, go to uh, go to a go station, and then be able to get into the city. So absolutely, I think we need to focus on how to just help families buy fewer things because that's something you can do. Can't really affect the overall inflation unless Tiff Macklem's here, but I don't believe he is. <laughs> uh, there's not much you can do to uh, control prices. All right, uh, Minister of Finance, a two-part follow-up for you. Number one, advice to this crowd on what they can do about inflation? And uh, number two, uh, how long have you been a shapeshifter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, never, and I feel very comfortable being a conservative, uh, for sure. Uh, but, you know, we're all, we're all uh, talking about share challenges and, and how to come up with the solutions, and, and that's why this is so, so important to have these discussions. Uh, I, I would just say a couple of things. Uh, first off, the building uh, building more homes. I mean, there's no question with 200,000 people coming. I'm the son of refugees. 200,000 people coming to this province every year, and that, I'd like that number to grow. We need more people. That's part of our labor shortage challenge in, in all developed countries. To our means very first point about aging, we're not alone. So we have to think very hard and strategically about how. We can bring more people into this province to to be able to uh, to to grow our economy, uh, not least of which is uh, it, helping uh, where the federal government can with their immigration nominee program. You know, of that two hundred thousand, we only get about five percent of the jobs that we need to say in what we need, like skilled trades, like welders, uh, healthcare, P PSWs, nurses. So I, I think that's one of the things where uh, working together with the municipalities through strong mayors and other mechanisms to make sure when the people come to this great province that they actually can live somewhere. Uh, and that's why the million and a half target, uh, that's that's a very ambitious target. Uh, last year, we we saw the province build uh, just over 100,000 new units, which is the highest number in over 30 years. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate it. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.